Gracias, Silvan. Um, so I, I will speak in English, and I just want to thank everyone for coming today, um, and also thank uh, Saish for hosting me, um, and, and for coming um, apparently during a, a strike. Um, so <laughs> I, I'm happy that you're here and you decided to uh, come and, and listen to me talk about rats. Um, so I, I don't really um, do research on rats, um, so I, I should make this very clear. Um, Lately, I have been teaching about rats, and in the context of teaching, um, I've become very interested in thinking about rats as a, a research subject. So this talk really uh, draws upon my teaching experience and uh, questions that I've been raising within the context of teaching uh, about rats, and specifically within the context of uh, uh, sociology, history, and philosophy of science. Um, I think it's very appropriate that I'm here in an interdisciplinary center uh, to talk about this subject. Um, hopefully you'll see how rats uh, themselves are interdisciplinary animals, um, so we'll, we'll see. Um, this talk is really going to proceed in three sections. Um, first I want to explain how I became interested in uh, rats um, as, as a subject of research. Um, and then I'll raise the question. Um, is the rat a boundary object? And I'll explain what I mean by boundary object um, as we move forward. And finally, um, I'll talk about, I'll talk about <laughs> in the microphone, uh, you know, the, the work that rats can do um, uh, as a boundary object. So in other words, boundary work. Okay, so where comes the rat um, in my thinking? Um, how, how is it that I became interested in rats? Well, actually, um, the, before I started thinking about rats, I started thinking about, oh. <laughs> uh, the, <laughs> the water lily. Um, so, uh, as some of uh, my colleagues know, um, I've for several years been working on uh, the uh, large water lily known as Victoria Amazonica uh, a as an object within a history of science. And um, from that work, I began thinking about natural objects as agents within history. And from this work on the lily, in fact, I became interested in how lilies um, are represented uh, within large books. And then books themselves became objects uh, of my interest in my historical research. I um, mean, here you see a florilegia that was uh, a container of a representation of these large lilies. Um, it wasn't long after that that I was asked to teach a course at my university, uh, DePaul, and uh, liberal arts, uh, but from three different perspectives. Um, so three disciplines in order to excite students about the liberal arts as a field of, of uh, study. And I decided that instead of focusing on the lily, I would focus on a, a furry animal. Um, and for some reason, rats seem like the perfect animal. Um, in, in Chicago, uh, where I teach, uh, rats are uh, a problem, and it made sense to select a problem that uh, students would be familiar with um, in, in my teaching. So I, I taught this course, and um, apparently, uh, because I taught this course, it became known that I was an expert on rats, <laughs> even though I'm really not an expert. Um, and it wasn't long um, after teaching this course that I was invited to appear on public television to provide some commentary about recent news um, in Chicago about rats. Um, and so I am now talking more publicly about rats um, as a, a, a subject of interest. So within the context of uh, news in Chicago, um, I started thinking about the rat as something other than just an academic uh, uh, topic for study, but also as a, a problem that has uh, much uh, public awareness, uh, public interest. Um, the uh, news in Chicago was uh, swirling around how there were many complaints about rats, um, and Chicago suddenly became the uh, uh, the top city in the United States with the most rat complaints. 
and lots of news came out about this. Um, so if you Google Chicago rats, uh, you'll see all of these news stories. And um, you know, Chicago beats out New York City, Boston, and Washington as America's rat capital. Um, I'm not sure why uh, we care about rats and baseball, um, but there's actually an interesting connection here with this news about the prevalence of rats in Chicago. Um, and the news stories go on, and um, even within the context of politics, um, <laughs> there's this uh, phenomenon of <laughs> rats, you know, of interest, um, not only because they're very popular in Chicago, but because uh, they are now making their scene in, in American politics. And I'll come back to that point uh, later in the talk. Um, I, I can't resist uh, talking about the connection with baseball. Um, so, you know, American baseball, um, in Chicago there's a, a team, the Chicago Cubs, and where they play is called Wrigley Field. And during one of the games, um, and you can see, you know, in the picture there, um, a little rat that was trying to jump up on, onto the, the wall uh, from the fence. And uh, one of the fans that was in the uh, stands um, took a video of this rat trying to jump up onto the wall. And of course, this went viral and became a, 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 a subject for the news. Um, so as this story explains, um, the rodent regaled fans at Wrigley Field when he tried to jump from the fencing. Um, the Chicago photographer filmed how Chicago Cub fans cheered on the Wrigley Rat instead of their home team. So now the rat was more interesting than the, the baseball players. At first the rat did not make it, but being fans they started shouting, jump, jump, you can do it. Um, and then later in the story, you know, they actually mentioned Chicago as, again, a place where there are lots of rats. So even though the main story was this rat at a baseball game, um, the broader context around that event was the fact that there are lots of rats in Chicago. Well, actually, and this is a point that I want to distinguish, Chicago has had a lot of rat complaints. Um, so. It, I was asked to go on television to talk about uh, my uh, opinion about the rise in rat complaints in Chicago. What does this mean? And um, really, there was just one main point that I wanted to make um, you know, during this interview, and that is uh, the number of rat complaints really doesn't tell us anything about the actual rat population. People can be complaining and complaining, oh, I saw a rat. But that doesn't necessarily mean that there are lots of rats. Um, so I wanted to beg the question, um, just because there are lots of complaints, does it mean that there is a large rat po uh, population? Um, my host, Phil Ponce, actually understood that. So you know, he acknowledged, so there's really not a correlation between complaints and a large rat population. And I'm like, that's right. Um, there, we, we just don't know. Um, however, the TV producers nevertheless um, <laughs> identify Chicago as the rat capital, and Chicago leads the nation in rat population. So they did not hear what I had to say, um, and this frustrated me. You know, it's like you invite you know a, a university expert on television, and no one listens, right? Um, so within the space of that frustration, I realized um, that there's something about the status of a rat that um, it, it, it means something different depending on the audiences and the social worlds in which it's, it's understood. And this is the, the crux of my, my current thinking about the rat as a boundary object. Um, so when Shaban um, very graciously uh, asked me to come and, and give a talk here at UNAM, I thought, you know, maybe this would be a good subject to, to pose the question, is, is the rat a boundary object? And if so, how, how can it be? Um, oh, th th this is just a graph to make the point that depending on how you measure rat complaints, Chicago could be at the top or it could be in the middle. Um, one of the known problems with complaint statistics is that there could be many repeat complaints and so if you actually look at statistics by numbers of households, then all of a sudden Chicago is in the middle of the pack. Um, so th this is just to go to show you that Chicago may not actually be leading uh, the country in rat complaints. 
So I, I want to explore this question about the rad as boundary object um, from, uh, with respect to three different worlds. Um, so we've got the world of public affairs, and I was just you know, referencing that in my introduction. Um, but we also have the world of the sciences, um, so the rat as uh, an object within the sciences, and then also within the arts and humanities. Um, so I will be asking this question uh, about how is it that the rat may function as a boundary object within these, uh, at the boundary of these three, three worlds. Uh, boundary object is a concept that grows out of the sociology of uh, scientific knowledge. Um, it actually um, comes out of the work of Michel Calon and uh, Bruno Latour. Um, but the actual uh, term boundary object was coined by Susan Lay Starr in a paper in 1988. Uh, for those of us who are historians, we, we general, generally go back to the paper that she co-authored by, uh, or co-authored co with James Griesmer in 1989. Um, they had done a case study of the, uh, 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 the Museum of Vertebrate Zoology uh, at, at uh, Berkeley. Um, and, and thinking about that museum uh, as a space where um, uh, boundary objects uh, matter. Um, and it's within this paper that they define uh, boundary objects and give examples. And so, um, you know, before I consider the question, is the rat a boundary object, first we need to understand what is meant by boundary object. So according to Starr and Griesmer, a boundary object is an analytic concept um, of those scientific objects which both inhabit several intersecting social worlds. And I'm thinking, Great, okay, so uh, the rat seems to do that, seems to occupy, occupy a place between um, several intersecting worlds. They have different meanings in different social worlds, but their structure is common enough to more than one world to make them recognizable, a means of translation. So even though um, a, an object might be understood differently in different worlds, um, there's enough familiarity uh, with the object itself so that people can talk to each other across these worlds. Um, so it, it, it's not so important that people understand um, that object in the same way. Um, what matters is that um, there's enough overlap in their understanding of that object that they can talk to, to each other. Um, you know, and then further in this paper they make the point that when, when you're um, collaborating across these social worlds, um, they pre they, uh, people frequently have the experience of addressing an object that has a different meaning for each one of them. Um, and even though there's that difference, it doesn't matter because they're still able to talk to each other and do useful work um, because of that common boundary object. So um, w within that same paper, Starr and Griesmer give you know, several kinds of uh, examples of kinds of boundary objects. And one of those kinds is, is something uh, that they identify as the I ideal type. And um, one example that they give of the ideal type is the species. Um, this is a concept which, in fact, describes no particular specimen. Um, it incorporates both concrete and theoretical data and serves as a means of communicating across uh, worlds, so the worlds of, the th of theory and the worlds of, of practice. Um, so as we know, rats um, you know, belong to um, several species. Um, the most common species that are uh, of the rats that we see in cities um, is the uh, ratus norvegicus. Um, but there's other species of rats. And um, what I would say is it doesn't really matter. Um, the rat as an animal um, and as being, belonging to several species, um, this idea of it serving as a boundary object can actually work. Um, you know, despite that variation in, in species. Um, so I'm going to go ahead and posit that the rat does qualify as a boundary object. And what I would like to do now is explore how it can serve that way in these different uh, worlds that I had uh, um, um, suggested. And I'm going to start with the sciences. So um, the sciences, in a way, is really a, a galaxy of, of uh, um, several different, uh, you know, like solar systems. 
And um, with respect to the rats, um, I, I think the solar systems that um, really matter are those of, of biomedicine, um, animal behavior studies, and also urban ecology. And I'm going to comment on how the rat appears in these different uh, solar systems um, differently. So in the space of urban ecology, um, they're actually the underdogs um, of the sciences. Um, urban ecology is a relatively new field, um, even though ecology itself is not. Um, but to think of the urban center as um, an ecological system, that, that's relatively recent. And so um, urban ecologists that do research on rats, um, you know, they're um, swamped by the amount of research that exists on rats from other fields. And as uh, one urban ecologist, uh, Michael Parsons, had recently pointed out, um, you can find thousands and thousands of papers about rats, but they tend to come from the disciplines of biomedicine and behavioral studies, um, you know, as well as uh, rat physiology. Um, as he wrote, rats are the most common models for human illness and metabolism. Studies of rat physiology and behavior are well represented. However, the vast majority of these studies are performed on lab rats due to their similar sens sensory acumen. Um, so, and because of the abundance of that research, you, you might think, wow, we know a lot about rats. Um, but with an, an urban ecological perspective, actually we know very little. So in other words, we might know a lot about rats in a laboratory, but we don't know much about rats on the streets. And, and this is the point that uh, Michael Parson is making here. Um, so to underline uh, th this point, uh, you know, we actually um, see a lot about the laboratory rat um, in popular science. Um, this is a uh, series by uh, the uh, popular uh, show SciShow, um, which you can see on YouTube. And they have a very interesting uh, short uh, video about the laboratory rat and its history. And I, I, I recommend it, and it's something that you can find online. Of course, information for that show comes from a, a, a historical literature um, that has looked at the origins of the lab rat. Um, Historian Bonnie Klaus has a, a very nice paper about the Worcester rat. Um, and so what she shows in this paper is that the common lab rat is actually um, the same lab rat that uh, originated from the Worcester Institute. And um, genetically, they're very much uh, a part of the same strain of rat. Um, lab rats are very much a standardized uh, laboratory uh, tool. Um, Karen Rader has a, a book about lab mice. Um, lab mice, similarly, are standardized, and um, you know the, the common lab mouse comes from Jackson Laboratories. Um, in both of these stories, it's interesting about the origins. Um, so these uh, rats and mice were bred um, by breeders, and those breeders tended to be amateurs as opposed to professional scientists. And um, what I like about the uh, origins is that um, they involved uh, a large proportion of women uh, practicing um, in, in these uh, fields, um, usually as amateur breeders, fanciers, um, or assistants. And so we owe the lab rat uh, to Helen Dean King, um, who was the one who bred uh, Worcester rats. Um, and here's a picture of her with her rats um, from 1920. Um, I, I I want to um, point out that one can really, uh, you know, get into this subject quite deeply. Um, there's a whole context for how women participated in uh, natural history and uh, the biological sciences in the late 19th and early 20th centuries. Um, I've done some work on that, um, not so much with rats, but with butterflies. Um, I, I thought butterflies were more interesting um, <laughs> previously. Um, and then my colleague, Marsha Richmond, has look at, looked at women um, in early genetics. Um, again, those women oftentimes uh, participating in breeding um, animals for, for research. Um, and oftentimes within domestic settings. Um, and so I'm going to give a little commercial here for um, if this is something that interests you. Um, some, there's some really good um, recent work that has come out on, on this subject. Um, but coming back to rats, 
Um, so within behavioral studies, um, again, the lab rat has had a very uh, um, uh, common uh, uh, occurrence. Um, and there are some programs of research uh, that are famous, um, and, and one of those being uh, the one that was uh, uh, um, founded by Kurt Richter um, in 1946. Um, in Baltimore, and he established what has become known as the Rodent Ecology Project. And um, Richter's uh, um, experiments are famous because um, he wasn't so kind to the rats, um, but um, as a result of his experiments, we've learned some interesting differences between behaviors of lab rats and behaviors of uh, feral rats, or rats that are uh, wild in the streets. Um, Following uh, Carl Richter was John Calhoun. Um, John Calhoun created a laboratory in which he bred rats and, and watched um, how, how they behaved in a confined setting. What's interesting about these studies is that when rats are confined to a certain uh, space with limited resources, they don't reproduce as, as much as they would if they have unlimited space. Um, so um, uh, Calhoun has done a, a series of uh, these kinds of uh, studies on uh, rat and rat behavior um, in, in what he uh, called his universes. Um, so we have some pictures of the universes that he created for his rats. He did this for some time at Johns Hopkins University and then also later at Casey Farm and then um, at, at a site of the National Institute of Mental Health um, known as NIM. And of course, NIM is where we uh, get some of the uh, popular stories about rats, um, you know, the, the novel and the movie, The Secret of NIM. Um, there, again, there's good historical research that looks at this context uh, for the laboratory rat. Uh, we've got a good biography on Kurt Richter uh, by Jay Shulkin. And then uh, an ISIS article about uh, Calhoun and his research uh, in connection with NIM. Um, by Edmund uh, Ram Ramsden. And I just point this out to indicate that there's, you know, again, a, a nice area of, of historical scholarship um, that talks about uh, rat research, um, you know, from this perspective. But coming back to um, urban ecology, um, so this is a very active program of research now, um, currently. Um, so Michael Parsons um, has done some work in Manhattan, New York. And there he uh, was interested in uh, following the movements of rats and how those uh, aligned with sensory stimuli. Um, and he thinks that his work will show um, some interesting uh, patterns with respect to uh, vectors of disease, um, you know, by, by seeing how, how rats move, move through the city. Um, Another uh, program of research is carried out by this gentleman, um, Matthew uh, Combs, um, who's at Fordham. And he has looked at the genetics of rats, and he's um, indicated how um, within a, a single city, you might have uh, the same species of rats, um, but there's variations um, you know, within. And, and those variations are geographically uh, distributed. Um, so in this study in 2017, he showed that there was a, a distinctness between uh, uptown rats um, from the lower town Manhattan rats. And of course, you know, journalists found that quite funny, you know, so you have the uptown rats that are, you know, very fancy and <laughs> the lower town rats that, you know, are, are pretty scuzzy. Um, but he carried out this research in other American cities um, and showed a similar kind of pattern that there's a distinctiveness between uh, rats within the same city. Um, one other kind of uh, um, area of, of uh, understanding rats um, scientifically has been in the context of what I would term uh, modern uh, uh, nat natural history. Um, so a, a, a best-selling book um, by this author, Robert Sullivan, and Robert Sullivan, Sullivan is just a, a writer, so he's not a scientist at all, but he went out into New York City and followed rats around and took notes, made observations. He also interviewed a number of rat experts, um, both university experts as well as uh, uh, rat uh, pest control professionals. Um, and, and so um, he uh, reports on his observations in this book. Um, 
one review of this book um, compares it to uh, compares Robert Sullivan to a modern uh, um, Henry Thoreau, um, and it, and that's only to say that um, another way of understanding rats, um, again from you know a, a scientific perspective, but in this case um, natural history. So to summarize um, this uh, galaxy uh, of uh, the, the rat as a boundary object in the sciences. Um, within biomedicine, we've got uh, rats as a standardized tool, um, rats as a proxy for humans. Within uh, behavioral studies, rats within their own right as an experimental subject, but again within a laboratory setting. And then within urban ecology, um, rats as a part of urban wildlife, rats as a part of an ecological system. Um, so there's these different ways in which um, rats are appearing as, as an object. Let, let's move on to public affairs. So <laughs> rats have a, a, a quite, quite a public presence um, in, in um, American cities, um, usually in the subways. And again, a subject for uh, social media, for people that are taking uh, videos that they post on, on Twitter and whatnot. Um, so for a while, um, there was the famous pizza rat um, who struggled to carry a piece of pizza up the stairs. Um, there was also the tug of war um, between two rats over a French fry. Um, and you can see in the video that they're you know, pulling back and forth. Um, and then there was the rat that found this you know, lovely avocado um, and then became known as avocado rat. Um, well, not, not all of these public images of rats are, are so kind. Um, other ways in which rats um, make a public appear appearance is as these nasty creatures that um, like to eat babies. Um, so there was a famous story that came out um, you know, uh, from Mexico in 2016 um, in Acoman, um, which I, I guess is not too far outside Mexico City. Um, baby killed by rats while mom at dance. <laughs> Make sure when you go to your dance that your, your child is okay. I think that's the lesson there. <laughs> um, ba back in the United States, uh, a year later, we had a, a, another case that again, you know, um, made, made global news. Um, there was uh, an infant that was uh, bitten by rats in Arkansas. And again, apparently because of the neglect of the parents. Um, what, what's interesting about these stories, of course, it's not so much about the rats, but about uh, the neglect, uh, the neglectful parents, um, you know, so bad parenting, which in of itself can be looked at because of the social conditions of, of those families, um, you know. So, um, but the point is, is that um, you get, you know, fr you get these sort of humorous images of rats, and then you get these, you know, um, unkind um, images of rats, um, you know, within the public space. Um, within the United States, historically, um, rats attacking uh, infants um, has been a, a concern over um, decades. Um, within Detroit, um, there was a uh, uh, tracking, you know, numbers of rat bites, um, um, you know, that was done. Um, and this map here shows rat bites um, across three years, 1967, 1969, and 1970. And this was a real concern. Um, it, it, it was the sort of thing that came out in the news back in the 60s, also at the time that was a period of great social unrest. Um, it was also a period of concern over um, poverty and then also race issues. Um, Detroit in particular um, has, was a hotbed for how these issues came together. Um, in 1967, this was the uh, year of the uh, race riots, and again, Detroit was, um, you know, the place that made national news. Um, politically, um, Lyndon Bain Johnson was the uh, president of the United States, and in 1967, he declared a war on poverty. And as a part of that, and this is part of a broader social program of, you know, reforming uh, cities and, um, you know, um, you know, really addressing uh, social issues. It's where we get, um, you know, these um, federal social programs like uh, Medicare and um, uh, other ways in which it was meant to improve society um, overall. 
Um, but in 1967, um, Johnson also wanted to um, in, uh, put through Congress um, what was known as the Rat Bill. And it was very much a part of his uh, war on poverty. And he finally succeeded in uh, December 1967. Um, the speech that he delivered um, when announcing the success of this bill um, includes uh, you know, a reference to the little children in the slums, how rats have really been the public enemy number one. Um, so you see how um, this concern over you know, rats as an enemy of children um, you know, really fed into a, a broader narrative about social reform. and bettering um, cities um, in terms of um, social conditions, living conditions, and standards of living. Um, again, there's good historical work um, that looks at these issues. Um, this article by Malcolm McLaughlin looks at uh, this very uh, program of Lyndon Bain Johnson and his uh, attempts to uh, get um, a rat bill through Congress. Um, but there's other ways in which uh, rat control has been looked at historically, um, and, and specifically within uh, history of science literature. Um, here's an article by uh, Christine uh, um, um, Kiner, and then also Karen Sayer um, in, in the British context. Um, since Lyndon Bain Johnson, um, it's interesting how if you if you look at what happened since that rat bill of 1967, it turns out that the federal government um, retracted a lot of its funding of these um, efforts to control rats, and the responsibility then fell uh, to m municipalities. Um, so it was really up to city local government to take care of the rat problem problems within their cities. Um, in, in Chicago, um, you, you can see signs of this on the streets um, of what the city is doing. Um, Part of it is education, so you see the posters, don't feed the rats. Um, one of the slogans is, if rats can feed, then they can breed. Um, w when the uh, city um, puts down poisons um, to uh, control rats, um, they will put a sign up, um, as you see there, warning, target rats, and they'll put the data which that they had um, laid down the po poison. Um, of course, another part of it, is, uh, of the city strategy, is um, effective uh, waste management. In other words, taking care of garbage. Apparently, it's failing in this alley, um, which is um, actually the alley where I live. Um, <laughs> my neighbors are, are not so good about taking care of, of their trash. Um, and then you'll also see uh, traps with, with baits, um, uh, or boxes with baits, um, uh, you know, poison. So rats will go into the box, eat the poison, and then go away, and then apparently they'll die you know, within their burrows. Um, these are all forms of, of rat control um, that are promoted by uh, city governments. Um, the more uh, modern approaches to rat control include um, something called contrapest, which is a form of birth control. So um, apparently, this will not kill the rats, but it'll make them sterile, so they can no longer have babies. Um, you know, I guess that's more humane, um, <laughs> a form of rat eugenics, I suppose. Um, and then you have uh, um, dry ice, um, and Chicago was, uh, you know, um, you know, made a big deal out of how they're going to take on this program of, of using dry ice. So you put the dry ice down in the rat holes, and the fumes from the ice um, causes the rats to suffocate, and then they, you know, die peacefully in in, in, in their homes. Um, <laughs> some of the, uh, you know, more uh, community-oriented um, activism uh, around rats um, include uh, feral feral cat programs. Um, so putting cats to work. Um, this is a sign in one of the neighborhoods uh, um, in Chicago, cats at work. Um, so cats are trained um, and, and taken care of and just allowed to roam around into, in the neighborhood. Um, but what they're doing is they're actually um, chasing rats or um, scaring the rats away. I don't know if they're actually eating them. Um, and then, of course, you've got private extermination companies and community education. And I want to dwell a little bit on community education. 
So let's return to our friend Matthew Combs, um, the uh, um, uh, biologist who's studying uh, rats in the city, um, you know, specifically rat genetics. Um, he's been very active in promoting um, community education about rats. Um, so rats are not just public enemy number one attacking babies, but there's a lot to know about rats. And so he um, uh, organized this uh, event um, in New York City. This was uh, back in 2017. And not only are, is he educating um, the public about rats through these posters, but there was also this um, art exhibition of uh, um, rat paintings um, on the sides of buildings. I've done my own um, attempts at public education um, by presenting in high schools. Um, so here's me trying to present to the uh, gifted students um, of Woodridge High School, which is near, nearby Chicago. Um, my main message there to the students was, well, yeah, rats are kind of disgusting, but they could also be, you know, nice and friendly. Um, and one way I made that point was by um, telling them about the uh, Gambia uh, pouched rat um, that is put to work um, in Cambodia um, to help detect uh, landmines. Of course, Cambodia still has a lot of landmines that, that cause a lot of injuries and deaths. Because the uh, uh, Gambia rat is, is light enough, even though it's a big rat, um, you know, it doesn't set off the, the landmines, um, and it's trained to be able to detect, uh, you know, because of the smell of the shrapnel and, and, and whatnot. Um, so there's an organization, um, a popo, um, that trains these rats, and, um, you know, and there he is, uh, a specimen that is on the fields of Cambodia uh, doing his job. Um, so, th so what this does is it opens up uh, the possibility of rat being a friend as opposed to just an enemy, and um, and this is also something that gets picked up in uh, you know popular uh, culture. Um, I've also learned that rats can be friendly. Um, so one of my students brought uh, their pet rat to class, and um, I had the opportunity to to hold the rat, um, and. It was all right. <laughs> <laughs> so to summarize the rat in public affairs, um, we have uh, rats that are a uh, proxy for poverty. So where there are rats, there also tends to be um, social conditions that include poverty. Um, because of the prevalence of rats um, in underserved uh, neighborhoods um, that are lacking in, in city and social services, it also is a proxy for racism. Um, in terms of rat control programs um, w within cities, rats are seen as a pest. Um, and then also, um, in, as I had just uh, you know, showed you, they can also be service animals um, or, or companions. Uh, so these are the multiple ways in which uh, the rat serves as a boundary object in the space of public affairs. So finally, I come to arts and humanities. How many of you have seen Ratatouille? <laughs> There's a, a good uh, Spanish version. I've, I've seen it online, it's, it's free, um, so um, <laughs> I, I, I encourage, encourage you to watch it if you haven't. Um, of course, what uh, Disney does in Ratatouille is um, something that I, I want to emphasize in this final segment of, of my, my lecture, and that is there's a way in which the rat uh, has a very close relationship with uh, human beings. Um, and there's a way in which um, it's not just the rat's uh, versus uh, human beings or um, in friendship with human beings, but there's an interesting overlap that happens where rats become humans um, or humans become rats. It, it, it almost, uh, you know, um, sort of blurs the boundaries between the rat as its own animal um, separate from human beings. And, and I think it's done very effectively in, in Ratatouille. I mean, you remember Remy is in the hat and he's you know, making a, um, a w linguine, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> and of course, 
it underlines the point that where there's food, you'll find rats. Um, however, in this case, this is a rat that doesn't care so much about the food, but about being able to cook, and which is a very human uh, form of activity. Um, there's been some interesting uh, analyses of this movie, um, of course. <laughs> so um, we have an anthropological analysis, which um, actually looks at the colonialism uh, themes within the movie. And then also a legal scholar um, who uh, analyzes the, um, the legal uh, um, theory that is embedded within Ratatouille. I'm not so sure that uh, Disney intended that, um, but you know w w what's wonderful about movies is that you know um, the viewers are the ones who who make the meaning. Um, when I was thinking about um, cinema um, as a space for uh, rodents, um, of course, what comes to mind is Mickey Mouse, right? Because Disney um, created the most famous rodent um, of all, which Mickey. Um, but as I delved into the background of Mickey Mouse, um, what I discovered is that really it wasn't Mickey that came first, but uh, a, a rat that came before Mickey. Um, so Disney had a series called uh, the Alice uh, Comedy uh, uh, Cartoons, and um, there was one episode, Alice Rattled by Rats, and that came out in 1925, and that was before Mickey made his debut in 1927 in the famous uh, movie uh, Steam Steamboat Willie. Um, so you, here you see a, a clip, uh, a picture from uh, Alice Rattled by Rats, and you know, there's not a, a, a large difference between the way the rat is portrayed here in uh, Alice Battled by Rats and, you know, how Mickey looks um, later on. Of course, Mickey takes on many different um, uh, appearances, um, you know, a, 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 over the decades. And there's some interesting analyses about, you know, how Mickey has changed over time and, 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 and why that might be because of, you know, social conditions, um, you know, that um, promote a, a different image for Mickey. Um, <coughs> of course, what comes out of the, uh, the, the fandom around Mickey Mouse are the, uh, the Mickey Mouse Club. Um, and I, this is something I remember when I was a kid, and I would, there was a, a television show called the Mickey Mouse Club. And of course, you had the Mouseketeers that would wear their Mickey hats. I had my own Mickey hat. And if you go to Walt Disney World, you too can also get your Mickey hat. Um, <laughs> but what makes this so um, great is, again, you see this um, conflation of the rodent with the human. You know, here the um, kids are themselves becoming mice. Um, so I, I, you know, I, I love that image for that reason. Um, of course, there's many um, other uh, examples of modern uh, characters in cinema um, who are rats. Um, can anyone name any of these? Do como se llaman? Templeton from Charlotte's Web. Uh, Rizzo the rat from uh, the Muppets. This is uh, Professor Radigan. Um, from the, the great mouse detective, of course, Remy from Ratatouille. And then in the middle, we've got uh, Nicodemus uh, from The Secret uh, of Nim. <coughs> so um, John Calhoun, the uh, behavioral uh, um, biologist who studied rats at um, the National Institute of Mental Health, um, you know, attracted interest, uh, you know, by this writer, uh, Robert uh, C. O'Brien, who wrote this uh, novel, Mrs. Frisbee and the Rats of Nim. Um, of course, this was the basis for the movie, The Secret of Nim, that came out in 1982. And of course, where we got um, Mrs. Frisbee and Nicodemus, um, who is lurking there in the background. Um, so this brings us into the space of literature. Um, and I, I very briefly want to comment about um, the way in which the rat appears in literature. 
Um, of course, it's not just the rat, but the mouse. And we've got John Steinbeck here, um, his uh, famous book of Mice and Men. Uh, that phrase, mice and men, actually comes from a, a Robert Burns' uh, poem, Robert Burns being the uh, Scottish uh, poet that, who wrote in the 18th century, um, to a mouse. And um, legend has it that the inspiration for this poem was when Robert Burns was walking through a field and disturbed a mouse's uh, nest. And he felt bad about this because it was cold and this prevented the mouse from finding cover during uh, the, the cold winter. Um, and so we get the, uh, <coughs> the famous saying, the best laid schemes of mice and men, gang after glay, they often go awry, and leave us not but grief and pain for promised joy. Now rats, of course, um, have made a, a, a prominent um, uh, appearance in, in novels. Um, Albert Camus' uh, uh, The Plague um, is, is one of the um, best known uh, stories where uh, rats are, um, <laughs> you know, um, so th this was a, a modern uh, version of the, the Black Plague, um, you know, set in um, early 20th century France. again, depicting rats as, as pestilence. Uh, a more recent novel, Dr. Rat, by William Kotzwinkle. Um, this is one that I didn't know about myself um, until I was in El Bendulo um, a couple days ago, and I saw the Spanish uh, edition uh, of, of Dr. Rat, um, um, which I, I took a picture there. And there's many other, um, uh, you know, works of literature that, you know, we can find where the, the rat is a central character. Um, I came across one recently by uh, Kafka, um, The Burrow. And what I love about this story is that it, it talks about um, the, the home of the rat, um, but from the first person, it's almost as if the, the rat is the storyteller telling you about his home. And again, I, I think blurring, um, you know, you, you're, you're in that space of reading the story, imagining that, is this a human being that's, you know, t telling me about this or, or, or a rodent? Um, so again, that, um, that conflation. Um, within the visual arts, um, there's a long, long uh, history of, uh, of rats um, as part of the menagerie um, that accompanies Krishna. And then, of course, um, more recently, um, Kate McDowell, Mice and Men, her sculpture of uh, a skeleton of a uh, mouse, who, which is actually human. The union between man and nature is shown to be one of friction and discomfort, she uh, writes on her website. When I travel on a train in Chicago, I'm always, uh, you know, trying to pass my time, um, and I just happened to notice this tattoo of uh, another passenger, um, and I, I'm like, is that a rat? And indeed it is. Um, so there's a way in which uh, the rat becomes a, a, um, a part of popular art, um, hair tattoos, and then also of uh, graffiti. Um, so here's a famous mural um, believed to be by Banksy in uh, New York City. And what I like about this mural is that you've got a rat in a t-shirt, I love New York, um, who is drawing a, a figure of a rat. <laughs> I mean, isn't that cool? <laughs> so to summarize, um, you know, how I see the rat appearing as boundary object in this space, so we, we see the rat as fictional uh, translations of real life. Um, so they're imagined in ways that um, somehow relate to things that um, happen in real life. They're almost human. I mean, there's ways we can talk about, um, you know, whether they are actually human or almost human. I mean, rats, you know, still have a lower uh, place in the pecking order, so to speak. Um, they serve as allegories um, for what happens in, human, in the human world and they serve as symbols. Um, and, th and this is very clear, especially in, in, the, uh, um, in the space of art. Um, so very briefly to conclude, um, so 
I've explored the different ways in which um, the rat has appeared as an object in the sciences, in the public affairs, and in arts and humanities. Um, there's a way in which the rat actually um, crosses through these worlds and brings these worlds together in very interesting ways. Um, so I want to come back to that one news story, I Smell a Rat, um, because it underlines this point. So there was an opinion essay that uh, appeared in the Washington Post, and, and very recently, um, this was just last month, and of course it's within the context of the um, politics in, in America that are going on right now. Um, and um, this writer takes the opportunity to point out how w in Washington, D.C., just like in Chicago, there has been an increase in the number of rat complaints. And he writes, which by complete and total coincidence is the year that President Trump came to town. Just by coincidence, right? Um, so there's this way in which what's happening, um, I don't know, I guess ecologically within cities um, maps is, is being mapped onto what's happening in the realm of politics. The point is, is that these two uh, worlds are being brought together in very interesting ways. Um, the parallels, that are, the analogies that are being made um, between the so-called urban rat problem with actual rats and then the, the political rat problem um, with politics like you know, and, and, and politicians, and you can name Trump, Kavanaugh, and, you know, a whole number of, of politicians. Um, you know, Mexicans figured this out, you know, earlier. So, the, you know, about a year ago when there were the protests uh, happening in the streets of Mexico City and elsewhere, um, you know, uh, this idea of uh, aligning uh, politics with um, rat, ratty behavior um, is made very clear in this one poster, um, which reads, who, who is the rat under my pillow? And then, of course, if you read the uh, letters in that, you, you see the, the word Trump. Um, I actually happen to like the poster right next to it, Make America Sane Again. Um, <laughs> um, but that, that yet remains to be seen. Um, so coming back to our friend Matthew Combs and his uh, efforts at um, education in New York City, there's a way in which art comes together with uh, the sciences um, and then also apparently here taxidermy. Um, but it's bringing these different social worlds together in the same space, um, and, and that's the point. Uh, there was a uh, documentary film, The Rat Film, uh, that showed last year. Um, it was perfect timing because it was uh, released just during my class, when I was teaching the class. So I told all of my students to go watch this film, and, and some did. Um, the film does a beautiful job of uh, bringing in footage from uh, the spaces of laboratory science, the spaces of uh, pest control, the, paces of, uh, the spaces of urban politics. Um, and even the spaces of uh, uh, homes where people have pet rats. Um, so you can see um, in the one corner there, the pied pi the, 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 this gentleman with a pipe, um, you know, almost like the Pied Piper. Um, but what, what's hard to see is on his shoulders are his pet rats. Um, there's a very striking image in this uh, film um, which uh, was in intended um, by the, uh, the filmmaker, uh, Theo Anthony. And, and, and that is uh, this one, um, which was created by a data scientist um, in 2015. And it's showing an over overlapping map, um, the colored map of uh, Baltimore, um, and the film is set in Baltimore, um, you know, dating back to 1930. And this is when uh, the practice of redlining uh, was, was taking place. Um, so realtors were purposely making uh, um, loans, in, um, not, not extending loans or extending uh, um, uh, sale opportunities for real estate to certain groups of people that they found to be um, un, un, uh, um, not, not, not nice for the neighborhoods. In other words, it was a very racist practice. Um, 
this modern map um, that is overlaying uh, that colored map is showing areas of the greatest poverty. And it's no coincidence that the areas of greatest poverty um, also overlap um, those neighborhoods that, um, where, where there was discrimination in, in real estate practices. Um, it appears in this movie, The Rat Film, um, with the implication that it, it has something to do with uh, also the prevalence of rats in the city. Um, it's not made explicit. Um, it's, it's purposely left up to the viewer to, to draw that connection. So I end there. Um, so here you see the various uh, uh, galaxies and solar systems in which rats appear. Um, as we've seen, the rat has uh, status as a boundary object in many different ways. I, I think what remains to, to be further explored, um, and this is something that you know maybe I will do or maybe you, you all will do, um, to see the way in which these boundary objects bring these worlds together and, and, and cause them to overlap um, in very interesting ways. So with that, I say gracias and, and thank you. Yeah, uh, my question is about uh, the status of rat as, uh, rats are as boundary objects. I think one of the main issues or main interesting issues on the concept of boundary object is also collaboration between different groups of people. That's why uh, Grismer and Star and Grismer uh, do this uh, present this study, this case study, as focused on a particular museum, as they can show in this particular place how there is a um, kind of collaboration in the in the work of this museum, and I think you ha you have shown us a lot of different uh, you know uh, wars in which rats are important. But I think one of the next steps that you were saying that you maybe someone would like to address is also how many of these uh, social wars can collaborate each other and they can see rats not, I mean, they can not only see rats as, as the same object but with different, you know, um, perspectives, but also achieve some collaboration involving this, this particular animal. So that's my question, and I don't know if I can go on. Okay. Yeah, and... <laughs> can, can, can I comment on that? Huh? Yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah, um, so I, I... Thank you, Miguel. Um, and and, and I, I'm very aware that I'm, I'm doing something um, much broader here than um, what was the focus of uh, Starr and Griezmer, which was really looking at what, what's happening within scientific spaces and the collaborations that have, has to take place between um, researchers and then also funders of, of scientific research, um, collectors who may be amateurs, you know, so the variety of ways in which these different uh, worlds come together in that one space, um, in, in that case, the Zoological Museum. Um, because my own experience was, you know, in a teaching environment and then within a very public environment, and I was noticing these differences and understandings, I, I really wanted to beg the question about how these understandings come together and can be informed by this kind of perspective that Starr and Griezmer um, provides um, in, in, in their work. Um, and and I, I'd like to suggest that you're right. Um, so there's a way in which um, th this may um, um, uh, help explain or perhaps encourage um, collaborations that would be very useful. 
Um, in the case of urban ecology, um, as just one example, um, urban ecologists um, have a, a real challenge um, in understanding rats um, because their research subjects um, are, are, you know, very prone to being eradicated. Um, no, no pun intended. <laughs> <laughs> You know, because of the because of the uh, um, the programs of pest control. You know, so you know it doesn't really help them to to tag specific rats, um, because it's very likely that those rats will end up getting killed um, because they've eaten some poison or you know something as a part of the city's uh, pest control efforts. So um, what what urban eco urban ecologists like Michael Parsons um, is doing is actually partnering up with uh, pest control professionals to um, you know, participate in research um, in a way that um, you know, they're known about the rat problems and maybe they don't completely eradicate research subjects um, for some time you know, and then allow the research to take its place you know, before the, um, you know, the pest control measure is, is carried out. Um, or pest control professionals can inform researchers about places where they've discovered new burrows or nests. Um, you know, so there's a way in which that collaboration can be very fruitful. Um, and I think it goes the other way, too. Um, so um, urban ecologists and biologists and geneticists, as they're learning about urban rats, um, you know, it's actually um, helping inform um, the efficacy of, of pest control. Um, so it's known that we don't want a lot of rats in our streets because they do carry disease and they're scary um, and, and they cause depression apparently. There's research that shows us. Um, but if you just kill the rats, are you solving the problem? And the answer is no. You have to take a much more integrated approach um, to pest control that involves waste management um, as well as rat abatement, um, taking care of structures that you know could be homes for rats, um, you know, preventing them from access to food sources and, and that sort of thing. So it's a much more ecological approach um, to, to pest control than just focusing on kill, you know, kill the rat, you know. <laughs> So I, I just want, so I, I think you're right, and, and you can do that kind of like tight analysis, um, you know, with respect to particular sciences and show how that collaboration can be fruitful. You were going to say something else, though. Yeah, I, I think it was, well, my comment, it was about um, that you can see this kind of, of, of issues also in many other domestic or closer to domestic <laughs> animals. Um, in particular, you can see that in, in, of course, mice and and maybe fruit flies, maybe also uh, and also chickens, which are the <laughs> my own my very own subject of study. And and I think it's interesting how they're, they're, they these animals are also uh, they have a very distinctive role in sciences. Uh, you know, like passing from the, the domestic or, or household uh, environments to the, to the labs, which is also that it has been discussed in history and, uh, of science. And, and I think my other kind of question was that, uh, do you know what happened to the fancy breeders, rat fancy breeders? Are they still a thing or something? <laughs> yes. <laughs> um, <coughs> so there's a, I, I looked into this um, because I was curious uh, how, how I can find my own uh, pet rat and uh, there's breeders that breed rats and you can find them on the internet um, you know and you can go out to their farms um, and, and choose your, your, your own pet rat. Um, these uh, rats are also bred um, and sold within uh, uh, pet stores, not only as pets but also as um, food sources, um, you know, for uh, snakes and, and reptiles and whatnot. Um, so uh, there's a way in which, you know, um, fancy rats um, serve multiple um, purposes. So, yeah, thank you. Well, thank you for your talk, and I wanted to ask you, I think it's a very U.S. boundary object, and I want to ask you how would you address that point, because I don't think you can do this as a universal way of a boundary object. 
I think that the different cultural views really reshape your boundary object. But I'm just asking. Yeah, um, th thank you for making that point. Um, and, and I actually t totally agree with you. And, and I believe that um, sociologists um, that created this concept would also agree with you. Um, in, in other words, um, it, it's within very particular uh, local contexts um, in which a boundary object um, takes on its meaning and then also um, has its utility. Um, so I, I, I would agree. I, I actually went on the internet looking to see if you know Mexico City has a rat problem. Um, I and, and no, it doesn't. You know, so I'm not sure that um, you know c citizens here. I guess I'm wrong. <laughs> 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 but um, but I, I was talking with some friends, you know, before uh, coming here, and and they're, and they're like, you know, how would you make this, you know, relevant to an audience, you know, here in Mexico? And the point is, is that, well, you know, really, there's probably other kinds of boundary objects that one can talk about within this context, you know, that has more meaning. So I, I would not um, extrapolate this as a universal at all. I, I really wouldn't. Uh, although um, um, it, it is true that laboratory rats um, are almost universally the same strain of rats, and, you know, internationally, um, you know, you still have the same breed of rat that's used in laboratories. Um, how they're treated internationally varies, um, and, and the kinds of research that are being done, of course, varies. But I, I really appreciate that point. Thank you. Thank you for your presentation. It was very um, entertaining. <laughs> um, I have three I guess questions slash comments. One has to do directly with what he said I just asked. Um, in your analysis of, of Chicago as a quote unquote uh, rat capital, you mentioned that that perhaps there this is a, there is a false correlation between uh, population rat population and the, the number of complaints. So I was thinking, I don't know if I'm making myself clear. Um, so I was thinking, for you just said, maybe Mexico doesn't have a rat problem. We don't have a, a rat hotline. Does Chicago <laughs> have a rat hotline? It struck me as there, there's an infrastructure in Chicago where you can actually call and complain <laughs> that you saw a rat. There's no such thing in Mexico City. Perhaps that is the reason why there appears not to be a rat problem. But of course, where there's a large concentration of population, of human population, there's a large concentration of rats, right? So um, that was a comment. The second the Thank question you. is, um, so you showed us uh, a vast number of examples where uh, where the rat or some form of rat can can be at the intersection of different social worlds. I was wondering whether this really makes the claim that a rat is a boundary object, or rather this presentation might be read as there is a multiplicity of rats. Because movement is not the same as the rat we encounter in the subway. It's not the same as some knockout gene mouse that we find in a lab. Mm. Um, so, so could it also be read as a multiplicity of rats rather than one that one same object doing this boundary work? Right. And the third one is whether you could reflect on your own boundary work because you you. You presented us ways in which you are an educator and a researcher, an academic researcher, and a public speaker. So in a sense, what struck me the most from this presentation was not so much the boundary work that the rat was doing, but the boundary work that you were doing. <laughs> Thank you. Are you calling me a rat? <laughs> <laughs> no. um, <laughs> uh, thank you. Um, <coughs> So um, 
Okay, so your, your first point about um, Chicago being rat capital and um, the infrastructure that exists there that may not exist elsewhere, I, I think you're, you're absolutely right. Um, and, and this is one of the claims that I, I, I make um, in that interview on television is that it could be that Chicago has a much better developed reporting system than in other cities of the United States. And, you know, and so people are complaining more because they know about the system. It's very well uh, advertised. All you do is dial 311, I saw a rat. Oh, where was the rat, you know? Um, and, and so you, you get, you know, you get complaints. Um, and and it, it's also an online system, so you can, you know, l lodge a ticket, you know, just by, by going online. Um, there's also a way in which um, rat control varies um, from city to city, um, which may impact uh, how the numbers of rats are reported. So in New York City, for example, um, once they have a report of a, re of a rat in, in a location, they have this uh, method of sweeping out around uh, that uh, um, site, you know, where the rat was reported, and, and, and they do a much broader uh, scope of, of rat abatement than Chicago does. Um, so it could be that New York is just better about, you know, th the way they're controlling rats that um, diminishes the number of complaints that they get. Um, <coughs> I also think that um, people are seeing rats. <laughs> you know, it's not the case that they're just, you know, you know, go you know, going on the phone and saying, oh, I want to report a rat. You know, they're, they're actually seeing rats. Um, and, 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 and one reason why is because um, there's a lot of development that's been happening in Chicago and specifically in those neighborhoods where the most complaints are coming out. Um, Logan Square, for example, is a very up and coming area in Chicago. It's a neighborhood um, where there's been a lot of demolition. And it's no coincidence that the most demolition in Chicago happened in that neighborhood precisely at the time that that neighborhood became um, the leading neighborhood for rat complaints. So there's a dynamic that happens between reporting, what's happening that drives rats out into the open, and then also um, how cities are controlling rats that contribute to uh, these statistics. Um, so I, I take your point about um, Mexico City. Um, surely there must be rats here. I <laughs> um, and 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 um, but 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 the point is that we don't know how many. It, it's 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 very hard to count um, rats in cities. And and one of the uh, reliable uh, studies that was done of the numbers of rats in New York City. Um, estimated that there were two million rats um, in Mexico City, or sorry, did I say Mexico City? New York City. And, um, and, and that um, shattered a myth um, that there must be at least one rat for every person um, that lives in the city. New York City is, you know, at least eight million within, uh, you know, the immediate metropolitan area. And it turns out that, you know, this estimate um, showed that there, there could only be about two million rats. I would highly doubt that Chicago has as many rats. They have a much lower population than New York City. Um, you know, so I, I, I think that there's a lot to, to um, interrogate you know, when it comes to um, uh, speculating about rat, rat populations. Um, <laughs> so my talk, um, the rat is boundary object or um, a multiplicity of understandings of rats or types of uh, rat objects. Um, I think that's a good point, um, and I probably didn't do a very good job of focusing on cases where, indeed, this was a boundary object as opposed to, oh, look, a rat. Um, so I, I, I think that this can be right either way, really. Um, there's a way in which um, you know rats show up in a variety of contexts um, and oftentimes devoid of you know a broader um, social discursive uh, you know system of understanding, which of course is the point of uh, the sociologist. Um, so for an object to have meaning, it's not so much the object itself, but it's the system within which the object uh, takes on that meaning. Um, so there's an infrastructure um, which includes. Um, not only the object, but the technologies in which that ob object is embedded, the social uh, uh, um, environment in, in which that object is embedded. 
What struck me, and, and this is why I raised the question about boundary object, and again, um, outside of the space of just uh, the sciences, is that I found myself continually arguing that no, rat complaints doesn't necessarily mean you know numbers of rats, and there was a, 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 a mismatch between my understanding coming from the realm of the classroom and having read up quite a bit of rats just in, you know to be prepared for my teaching, and then people's common understandings of rats and and how you know there must be many 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 rats, and not only are there many but they're big. They're usually as big as a cat. So there's these social impressions about, and, and I think in that respect, um, you know, we, we get our, our um, understandings of rats from very specific places, and these places include uh, the, the, the movies, um, the literature that we read, um, what we learn about in biology, um, you know, and, and then what gets reported in the news. Um, so I, I think that there's actually much more coherence in the way um, rats are understood um, as an object. And, and of course, the, the point of a boundary object is not for it to be the same thing all the time, but it has to be um, similar enough in order for people to have conversations um, you know, from different social worlds. Um, I, I think this is a question that you know needs further exploration. Um, you know, I again, I am coming from the realm of teaching and you know and thinking about how this might be an interesting uh, uh, point point for research. Um, in terms of my own boundary work, um, <laughs> I'm not really sure what to say about that. <laughs> um, so, I, can you elaborate a little bit about um, you know like w w what you're thinking there? Um, yes. Well, I. I mean, when you mentioned you were you were called in by this uh, television network, and you're speaking publicly about what rats mean, what what sort of of, of issues are can be can be raised about rats, not only as a plague. I think you yourself are doing some some kind of boundary work, so bridging these uh, different social worlds together in through your public speaking, through your high school education, and even here. Yeah. No? Yeah. Um, interesting. So, and I don't know why I'm doing that. Um, <laughs> <laughs> it just seems like the thing to do. Um, so, <laughs> um, I, I think it comes back to a point I was trying to make um, uh, in, in the uh, my answer to Miguel's question, and, and that is um, when we understand um, rats in these different ways, um, we're better equipped to understand um, what can be done, what, what can't be done, what should be done, what shouldn't be done, um, and then also to appreciate um, not, not only you know, the object of the rat, but the environment within which the rat lives. Um, and, and so some earlier uh, teaching that I've done um, prior to teaching this uh, course about rats um, was really about urban ecology, uh, you know, much more broadly speaking. And uh, it, it's something that we're not used to thinking about. The city is an ecological system. You know, usually we think about nature, trees, lakes, um, you know, the water, the cycle of water. Um, birds, um, but all of a sudden when you have a built environment with buildings and subways, um, and within that environment you have animals, um, you know, how is it that we can understand, you know, that system as a natural system, um, and then, you know, use that information for making decisions about urban planning, uh, pest control, and, and, and so on. Thank you. Thank you. My question is centered more in the boundary object. After your presentation, it's clear that the rat is a, is a, is a good example of a boundary object. But um, I was wondering that if all these examples you gave, all this um, infrastructure that is needed, or all these, I don't know, uh, people involved in writing, talking about rats, or studying rats, are necessary to have a boundary object. Uh, what I'm trying to say is that can we create a boundary object or do we need um, these circumstances, maybe scientific circumstances, social circumstances, even political circumstances? Because if you present an animal as a boundary object, you are making it so much more visible than just you know a simple rat that lives on the street. 
So that's, that's where my question is going. Can we create a boundary object to promote interdisciplinary studies, maybe? Why not? <laughs> <laughs> but yes. as a teacher, do you think that would be so useful? Yeah, um, thank you. I appreciate that question. Um, so when I taught this course, and, and there's also an online version of this course, so students are taking this course um, online. Um, I'm not the only instructor now for this class. Um, I have colleagues who are, are teaching this class. They know nothing about rats, nothing about science, um, but they love teaching this class because the students, I mean, it's amazing, you know, how they come to this subject, and everyone has a rat story. Um, <laughs> everyone. Uh, uh, in Chicago, they have a rat story anyway. Excuse me. Um, so now, now I am actually thinking about the utility of um, organizing my presentation about rats using this concept of boundary uh, object because it precisely does what you just said. It's not just about the physical rat, but it's the rat, you know, and however we define that rat within its a, a social system. Um, and, and then now it becomes um, a, a lesson, not about the object itself, but um, the system within which that object lives, and then also the, the systems, you know, so the, the galaxies, you know, as I was using the, um, the language there, um, through which that um, object moves. Um, so I, I think it can be very useful in, in that respect, so I, I appreciate the point. Are there people online? Yes. <laughs> so they're not on strike. I cannot read. Um, I, I'm not. I'm not. Um, so then um, I will make a comment. Um, First of all, thank you for coming. And um, for me, it's very important to see how uh, social studies of science and, in general, studies of science, philosophy, history, can be applied outside traditional questions. So when you mentioned you were interested in rats and how rats, like, um, are at the same time. A, a organism that is like a plague but also part of local fauna. Um, I found this as a very illustrative example of how we are finding um, a new, w not necessarily finding, maybe creating new trends in, in social studies of science or history of science. So I don't know if you could comment um, a little bit more on um, like research that we are currently um, developing that is also trying to think outside the non-human in terms of, of another kind of examples. For example, your example with lilies. Mm -hmm. And what kind of questions can we raise? Um, because for example, we have here uh, several biologists that are interested in social studies of science. And for them, it might be interesting, for example, these examples with um, urban, urban ecology. So I don't know if you could like mention some new kinds of questions, new approaches that could like serve as a guide for, I don't know, for motivation for undergrad thesis or something like that. Um, yeah, thank you. Uh, so uh, let, let me just disclaim that um, my, my main uh, um, identity as a researcher is as, as an historian. And um, why I started thinking about the lily is because of how it mattered to a, a larger historical narrative, um, you know, that I was working on. Um, but what what became very clear to me as I focused on that lily um, was um, how it had a life of its own in multiple uh, contexts. And, and coming back to the point earlier, um, you know the status of an object um, really matters on, uh, you know, the local, and I, and I would say historical context in which that object is functioning. Um, 
Meanwhile, um, within the field of history of science, and I would imagine science studies more broadly, um, people have been paying attention to objects, um, and there's this uh, thing known as object-oriented history, in which um, it's not just about plants and animals, but it's also about artifacts, um, collected objects that appear in uh, museums and cabinets of natural history um, within laboratories um, and, and that sort of thing. Um, and, and so I, I, I guess what I, in response to your uh, question, uh, which I appreciate, um, I've been collaborating lately with um, other scholars um, internationally who are also very interested in the status of um, plants as objects and, and, and what that um, can do um, for historical narratives, um, but also in uh, educating, um, you know, the public, um, you know, more, more broadly about the value of plants. Um, so I, I have uh, w one colleague, her name is uh, Tina Gianquito, and I think you know, know her. Um, so um, she's done some work on um, uh, w women um, in botany, um, and, and, and especially women commentators on, on Darwin. Um, but she is a uh, grant project um, underway right now. Um, and it's an international project in which she's um, inviting people to submit narratives about plants. Um, and they can be historical, philosophical, or just everyday observations, you know, much in the, in the tradition of um, natural history observations, um, or from the garden, you know, so, and they're, they're, they're uh, um, uh, 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 collecting these narratives and putting them online um, a on a website. Um, and I, I'm forgetting the name of, of, of their project, but, um, you know, I, I can find that out. Um, meanwhile, um, one of my other colleagues, um, Jim Endersby, um, who is at uh, University of Sussex, and has also been doing some really interesting work um, on looking at plants as objects. Um, and um, most recently, he's got a book out um, through University of Chicago um, on orchids. Um, he and I are collaborating on uh, an international collaborative grant um, that has to do with uh, plants. Um, the name of this grant is called The Movement of Plants, um, so how plants move. Um, and, um, and again, it's, it's really intended to bring together a network of scholars internationally uh, to contribute their perspectives on a plant um, or, you know, some representation of a plant. Um, and, and it's meant to really encourage this kind of uh, interdisciplinary collaboration. Um, so we're, we're just in the process of uh, applying for um, a uh, international uh, grant through the uh, um, AHRC um, through his institution. So we'll, we'll see what, what becomes of that. Um, but but uh, w what I want to say is that there's a way in which um, making the, um, uh, the plant as an object the focus of scholarly inquiry brings together different discipline and allows interdisciplinary conversations in, in, in very interesting ways. Um, so, I, 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 you know, th that's what I would offer um, for those of you that are, are, are wanting to, uh, um, you know, d do research in this area. Um, so it's not just about looking at it through your disciplinary lens, but then talking with someone that is coming at the same um, subject through a different disciplinary lens, and then, you know, the, the interesting results that comes out of that uh, collaboration. No sé si... No sé si tengan más preguntas. Esto funciona. Bueno. No sé si alguien tenga alguna pregunta en español. No. Bueno. Um, pues en ese caso, Don, muchas gracias. Este, gracias por haber venido. Este, te doy tu constancia que. Oh. I know this is uncommon <laughs> in the U.S. Welcome to Mexico. <laughs> this is a local wow. tradition. So. I love it. <laughs> and it has rats on it, so <laughs> 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 you're going to love oh. it. Thank you very much. Muchas gracias. Uh,